Oh, <laughs> yes. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today at uh, Words and Pictures Festival 2021. You have joined us for the last of our sessions um, in our readers track, and these are our author readings. Um, and we're joined here today um, by two wonderful authors, Linda Graham and Molly Hunt. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about words and pictures, this is our fifth year doing this annual program that's hosted by Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries. It is our second year doing it virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Mary Obler, and I am the Deputy Director of Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries. And I am joined today uh, by Michelle Wagner, who is part of our, um, uh, I'm sorry, I. Um, yes, um, Diane. Not Wanda, Diane Clark. <laughs> All right. So sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, Diane Clark, who is part of our, um, she does do outreach. She is part of our outreach team. Uh, she works out of the Vancouver, um, the Vancouver Community Library. And um, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Like I said, we will be um, recording today. So um, please keep yourself muted while the other while the authors are speaking so we don't have background noise. You can put questions in the chat and we will monitor them and ask them at the end. And um, we're gonna get started today um, with Linda Graham and then we will have Molly who will be presenting afterwards. So to start, Linda grew up in Indiana but has lived in Oregon for most of her adult life. Her first book, a memoir entitled Indiana Summer from Cornfields and Lightning Bugs was published in 2016. It is a poignant and often humorous account of growing up in Indiana during the 50s and 60s. Linda enjoys camping and walking in the scenic Northwest, connecting with friends and family. She lives with her husband, Raul, and their two Manx cats. Linda and Raul enjoy swimming with dolphins whenever they get a chance. So I will have Linda um, start with reading today. Thank you so much. I, I've really been enjoying this year's uh, festival. Thank you for holding it again, even though it's virtually it's really good. We can all join in. Uh, so I am going to read from my third book, my second novel, and it is uh, entitled Fly Home Butterfly in Search of a Father. So this book isn't even released yet. It's due to be released, uh, they've promised me, the publisher, by October 22nd or so. So you could look for it after that time on Amazon or contact me on my website at uh, www.lindalgram.com. And I could also uh, be in touch with you for you to receive an autographed copy if, you, if you'd like that. So I'm going to begin with uh, just a very short summary and then read the uh, prologue in chapter one. Cassie, the adopted daughter of Tolly McMillan, decides to seek out her biological parents after years of wondering about her true identity. <clears throat> after finding her birth mother only to be rejected again, she is determined to locate her father. Her quest leads her to remote areas of the migrating monarchs in the US and Mexico, where she discovers her father, a reclusive entomologist, chasing the migration patterns of the monarch butterfly and harbors his own long buried secrets. Throughout the arduous search, Cassie encounters danger, but also finds friendship and love. As she begins to comprehend how her father's life mirrors hers, she starts to explore how it has affected her own identity. Fly Home Butterfly examines the larger themes of truth and the loss of innocence. And oh, I got it. I, I must tell you, just yesterday I received my uh, proof copy of the book. So I'm going to hold it up. <laughs> I'm so excited about that. So um, I'm going to read directly from that now. The prologue Cassie's Wandering. Uh, 2017. Like a butterfly stuck in a chrysalis, waiting for the perfect moment, I was waiting for the day I could burst forth and fly away and find my home. Quote from M. Rollins, our rock star. Well, it's been about 12 years. Here I am again, home at last in the kitchen of Tully, my adoptive mom. 
Her house is a different one in a new location and much smaller than before. It's a condo actually. However, her kitchen, although not as spacious as before, is arranged the same way. The gray earthenware canister holds wooden spoons, spatulas, and a wire whisk. I never once saw her whisk anything, but it takes its rightful place in the jar. Mom's stainless toaster sits on the cabinet near her refrigerator, same as always. The dishes in the cabinet are the identical white Corelware as from years before. Mom grins widely at me as she takes out a fork to whip up scrambled eggs, adding a little milk first. The milk is her secret to fluffy eggs, and she has always cooked them that way except for deviled eggs at Easter. Sebastian and Mandy sidle in, begging for food, as they predictably do whenever mom cooks. Funny though, she feeds them only dry or wet cat food, never human food. They smell her cooking and ask anyway. I doubt that they would touch human food if she put some down for them. I tried once with Penelope, but she sniffed and turned away. Penelope was my childhood nanny cat. Mom has always had cats in her home ever since I was one year old. And she told me she has always had cats even before I came along. Penelope was Jasmine's nanny cat too. <clears throat> Jasmine is four years younger than I, my adopted sister and parents biological child. <clears throat> I was one year old when Tully and Sean brought me to live with them and later adopted me. Now Jasmine is married to John and they have two young children, Josh and Josie. I will be 33 next month. No longer a young thing, but not old yet either. Here's your breakfast, Cassie, served with love. I was finally home again after wandering for years, searching for my real dad. Even though I left home at 18 to discover my real mom, when I found her, it only created more questions as to who I am and why. I know now that it all doesn't really matter when you have a home to come back to, but I had to find out for myself. Along the way, I too found lasting love, but I digress. Where do I begin? I suppose my journey begins shortly after my adopted dad, Sean, died of a heart attack. At the time, I still lived in Montana, but came back to Springville, Washington for the funeral. After that, I arranged with my employer to transfer me back home to Springville. A year later, I decided to search for my biological dad. I didn't even know his name at the time. So of course I had to return to Bozeman and ask my birth mother, Stephanie. That's the end of the prologue. Now I have a short chapter one, 2005. I awoke with a start in the semi-darkness, at first disoriented as to where I was. Then the odor of stale cigarette smoke and sour alcohol reminded me. Right. I was back in Stephanie's single wide manufactured home. The home of afforded two cramped bedrooms with a tiny bathroom in between. I slept in the extra bedroom, which was chuck full of boxes surrounding a twin bed. I groped through the light switch. The clock on the nightstand read 6 a.m., but it was still dark out. I had arrived yesterday and had tried to revive Stephanie enough to ask her questions about my real father. I replayed the conversation in my mind, still pondering the possibilities and thinking of more questions than answers. Once more, I had returned to Bozeman, Montana to visit Stephanie, my biological mom. I had been so disappointed when I had first found her two years ago. At that time, I could hardly wait to see her and get acquainted. I had thought that at last I would discover my true identity and roots. What a joke. I had eventually found her in this rundown, filthy home in a trailer park. Again, I knocked on her door. Stephanie, are you there? I called out, no answer. I jiggled the door handle and the door swung open. There she lay, passed out on her ugly brown threadbare sofa the empty vodka bottle lying on the floor told her story. Stephanie, it's me, your daughter, Cassie. I replayed the meeting of Stephanie over and over in my mind. Here I was again in her shanty of a home, 
still trying to figure things out. Huh? Who are you? And why the hell are you in my house? Stephanie's voice cracked as she looked up at me once more with glazed over eyes, dark circles surrounding them like raccoon markings. Her hair was a stringy, long, peroxide blonde mess, longer and coarser than before. She was in the exact same place, passed out on the same ugly sofa as when I first found her living here. Nothing had changed, with the exception that she appeared even more emaciated or shrunken. The old feeling of revulsion rose up my throat. I could taste the bile with it. She sickened me. I'll make you some coffee and then we can talk, I said, throwing my overnight bag onto the empty chair next to the sofa. Go away. I have nothing more to say to you. Stephanie turned her face toward the back of the couch, pulling the blanket up over her bony shoulders. I chose to ignore that and searched around in her kitchen cabinet until I found the coffee. Soon the sharp aroma of freshly brewed coffee cleared the stale cigarette stench somewhat. I hoped it would help to rouse her up a bit. That was yesterday. I decided to stay over another night to try again. Maybe today I could get her to recall something, anything, about who my biological father was or is. One thing I knew from my own dark skin, he was African-American, since Stephanie definitely was not. That should narrow things down for her somewhat, even though she had entertained <clears throat> excuse me, a steady stream of men who slept here over the years. The early morning was chilly, so I got up and threw on a tattered house robe I found in the closet. It was early November and the days were short and cold here in Montana. I stumbled into the kitchen area and saw Stephanie, still on the sofa, passed out from her nightly binge. I started coffee and looked around for something to eat. Inside the refrigerator were some eggs and a half loaf of bread. So I began scrambling eggs and popped two slices of bread in the toaster. At least if Stephanie could eat, she might become a little more coherent. The TV was still on, so I turned it to the morning news and turned up the volume, hoping that would help rouse her. I kept looking at her for signs of awakening. Finally, I saw her eyelids flutter. Good morning, Stephanie. I made us breakfast. Well, what? I don't eat breakfast. Forget it, she said, slurring her words a little her tongue obviously dry from sleeping with her mouth open. Today is different. We're going to eat breakfast together and I made some fresh coffee. I tried to sound chirpy and positive, but saw it wasn't having much effect. Stephanie had already turned to face the back of the sofa again. Come on, time to rise and shine. I don't know when you have to go to work, so I wanted to make sure we had enough time to talk. Talk? Talk about what? Her voice was muffled into the sofa, but at least she was speaking. First, let's get you up to the table. Maybe you need to splash water on your face before we sit down. I took hold of her by the elbow, bringing her into a sitting position. She didn't seem to resist and she sat up obediently. I led her into the back room and shut the door behind me. I poured two cups of coffee and set the table, waiting for her to come back out. After a few minutes, I heard the toilet flush and she emerged, still bleary eyed and disheveled, but at least she was walking on her own without stumbling. She plopped down heavily onto a chair, grabbing one of the coffee mugs and drew a long sip. Hot, she commented. Right, I just brewed it. Here are some eggs to work on. Then we chat. Chat? I have nothing to say. Just leave me alone. I don't see why you keep showing up here. My life is the same, with no room for you in it. Never did have room. Why do you think I gave you up? Stephanie frowned at me. Her statement would have hurt me two years ago, but I was over it now. I just needed information from her, and then I would be out of here. I let the hurtful comment hang in the air as both of us ate in silence. All that could be heard was the scraping of forks on plates. Hurriedly, I finished and jumped up to clear the dishes. I refilled our mugs and then sat with my coffee cup in hand. 
Okay, Stephanie, it's time for you to tell me something about my real father. Who is he? How did you meet? And where is he now? At that, Stephanie guffawed. Hell if I know, kid. You know my lifestyle. We were never married or even an item. You know what I mean? Not even sure who it would be. Why does it matter anyway? Whoever he was or is, he never cared about you. Why do you care about him? You must have some idea who you were seeing at the time I was conceived, right? Girl, you are so naive. It could have been any number of men. Stephanie, I persisted. Look at me. Look at me hard. Who did you sleep with who had skin like mine? Huh? Stephanie snorted and drank more coffee. Come on, think. Why should I? I don't owe you anything. You've had a great life living with that family, whatever their names are, right? Let's not get something going that shouldn't happen. Leave him in peace. Stephanie's face closed. She had had enough. She got up and rummaged around in her cabinet over the sink for another bottle of vodka. She poured out a little of the clear liquid in a glass, lifted it to her lips and swallowed. Don't you have to go to work at the restaurant? Stop drinking, talk to me. I'll call in. This upsets me. Go away and don't come back. Stephanie, no, don't do this. I must know. I have to figure out who I am, don't you see? Please, Stephanie, tell me. Tears formed in my eyes despite how hard I tried to keep them in check. I was begging, pleading at this point. She was the only one who could possibly help me. All right, all right, but I need my comfort to talk. Don't say I didn't warn you not to dig into the past. End of chapter one. All right, Linda, thank you so much. Oh, that's great. I'm getting like so my my to be to read list is getting longer and longer because <laughs> I'm adding so many books. I keep hearing first chapters. Oh, I'll like, bet. I'm wanting more about which chapter to go with. I thought, well, maybe that'll that'll work to throw that out there. Yeah, it's great. It's a good teaser. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, we're gonna um um we can take some questions now if we have any for Linda. And if not, we will start with Molly and then maybe we'll do questions at the end. It's always fun to get different perspectives on the same question, but let's see if we have anybody pops up in chat. All right. Okay. Well, I'm seeing people are eager for the next section, um, but I'm not seeing any questions. So let's, um, let's start with Molly. And let me um, just introduce you to our second writer here. Molly Hunt is a native Oregonian who has always had an affinity for cats. So it was a short step for her to become a cat writer. She writes the award-winning Crazy Cat Lady Cozy Mystery Series featuring Lindley Cannon, a 60-something cat shelter volunteer who finds more trouble than a cat in catnip and the Cat Seasons Sci Fantasy Tetralogy, where cats save the world. She also, she also pens a bit of cat poetry. Uh, Molly is a member of the Oregon Writers Colony, Sisters in Crime, the Cat Writers Association, if you didn't know one existed, and Northwest Independent Writers Association. She lives in Portland with her husband and a varying number of cats, and um, she is a shelter volunteer. So I will turn it over to Molly. Thank you, Mary. That was a nice introduction. I've been watching a lot of the uh, events this weekend and got some really great authors in the area. So I uh, write those things she said, but I'm going to read from something totally different, which is um, I started a new cozy paranormal uh, mystery series. And this is book one, it's called Ghost Cat of Ocean Cove. And the series is the 10th Life Cozy Mystery Series. And this involves a woman who has moved from Portland to uh, a fictional town on the coast, uh, her lifelong dream. Um, and she's 70, 70 years old. So here's from the uh, 
from the blurb from the back cover, septuagenarian Camelia Collins and her cat Blaze moved to the Oregon coast to fulfill a lifelong dream. But that dream becomes a nightmare when Camelia learns she has purchased a murder house. The former resident, reclusive businessman Jonathan Chamber, was brutally killed on the stoop, and the killer is still at large. But that's not all. Camelia discovers an ancient gravestone at the back of her garden belonging to a cat named Soji. Dead long ago, this seventh black kitten of a seventh black kitten now returns in corporeal form. Will Soji's haunting help Camelia solve the murder or send her screaming back to the city? So uh, because I don't think you need to watch me the whole time, I'm going to put on a little uh, slideshow of cats for you. Hopefully. Yes, there we go. Okay, chapter one, arrival and a surprise. Camelia Collins hesitated, the key halfway into the lock. What on earth have I done, she wondered to herself. How many people my age pick up and move house, leaving their old life behind to try something completely different and new? Not many, she imagined, again pondering her sanity, but they probably should. After all, if one doesn't follow one's lifelong dreams by the age of 70, one does one. Turning, she surveyed the modest neighborhood with its rustic homes perched on the bluff overlooking the sea. A rim of stunted pines clung to the edge of the cliff, and beyond that, Ocean Cove, where the surf beat upon the shore as it had done for millennia before and would do for millennia to come. Tiny and sheltered, its pebbled strip of, of shoreline curved in a flawless crescent. Camelia looked back at her new home. A rough driftwood plank hung from the front door, the words Love Cottage spelled upon it in seashells. Presumably the sign had been made by the loves, the folks who had built the little cottage back in the 50s. Yes, this had always been Camellia's dream. Now there she was, the dream come true. So why did she feel like she'd fallen into Alice's rabbit hole? Camellia shook off her wisp of apprehension and finished unlocking the door. Stepping inside, she gazed around at the cheerful room with approval. She had bought the house furnished and with a few minor adjustments, it would suffice until she had a chance to add her own personal touch. The bulk of her possessions would be arriving in a mover's truck the next morning, then it would be perfect. Again, she marveled at her luck. Property on the Oregon coast was expensive, yet this one had been quite affordable. The inspection had turned up no surprises. The pipes weren't broken, nor was the roof falling in. The realtor had explained that the man who bought it from the loves had died and his beneficiary was looking for a fast cash sale. After a long and convoluted probate, the elderly European uncle wanted nothing to do with the place. Camelia figured his loss was her gain. Camelia headed back to the car to retrieve her overnight bag. Rolling it through to the bedroom, she smiled as she took in the bright cozy space. A big window facing the Northwest would get the afternoon sun. A dresser, a wooden chair, and a single bed draped in a yellow chenille spread left her lots of potential to add her own touch. Yes, this will do nicely, she said out loud, her habit of talking to herself so well established that half the time she didn't know she was doing it. Very nicely, she added with glee. Making a second trip to the car, she hefted a large cat carrier from the back seat. His skulking inhabitant, her big tuxedo boy, Blaze, gave a meow of displeasure at the joggle. Can't be helped, Camelia told him. I know how much you kitties hate change, but you like this one, I promise. Camelia lugged in the carrier, along with a tote full of cat things, directly to the little bedroom. Once inside, she closed the door and opened the carrier gate. Blaze inched his way out, first a pink nose, then a white paw, then finally the whole black and white cat. He looked up up at his cohabitor with eyes the color of old fashioned seven up bottles, as if to say, what in the world have you done? You'll be fine, said Camelia. I'll get your box and food station up directly. Be a good boy and hold it for just a few minutes longer. Blaze shot her a dirty look, then hopped onto the bed and proceeded to scrutinize his new digs. As Camelia went back to the car for a third time, she dawdled along the pathway to take in the warm June day. The weather couldn't have been nicer and the air smelled of sea salt and roses. 
Someone must have loved roses, she thought to herself. They grew everywhere in the patch of garden. Old fashioned climbers twined in blooming profusion up columns of the front porch and bushes of cabbage roses lined the walkway, each of their pink, yellow and white blossoms as huge as an entire bouquet. Though in need of pruning, they seemed healthy and thriving. Whoever had owned this place had taken good care and it showed. Besides the roses, other perennials were crowded together in the English cottage style, delphiniums and hollyhocks, alstroemeria and canyon poppies. Any empty spots had been filled by nasturtiums gone wild, their gray green pads and rust red blossoms dotting the scape like a Monet painting. Just lovely, Camellia said out loud, wondering offhandedly how she was ever gonna keep it up. Startled from her reverie by a squeaking sound, she turned to see a woman shambling up the drive with the aid of a four-wheel walker. The source of the noise. Aging and frail, the woman appeared to be in her 60s. Her hair was done in the classic gray curls that might have been popular in her mother's day. Her large and loudly patterned house dress made no attempt to hide her spare figure. She wore little or no makeup, but her smile painted a blush on the pale face or perhaps it was the exertion of climbing the small hill. Are you the new tenant? The woman asked between breaths. I'm Vera, Vera Whitcomb from next door. She gestured to the small house surrounded by a classic white picket fence. Camellia held out a hand trying to keep from looming over the bent woman. At five foot eight, that was no easy feat. Camellia Collins, nice to meet you, but I'm not a tenant, Camellia corrected. I bought Love Cottage. Vera frowned. That's so? Well, um, welcome to the neighborhood, dear. Goodbye. She swung her walker around and started to shuffle away as fast as the contraption would carry her. Camelia found herself as much stunned by her departure as she had by her original appearance. Yes, and I'm very excited, Camelia aimed at the receding figure. We're here for the duration. At least that's the plan. Vera paused. We? Your husband as well, then? No, I'm a widow. I was referring to my cat. So Vera, Camelia quickly continued, maybe you could tell me a little about the area if you have the time. That seemed to spark Vera's interest. Well, yes, all right. The smile returned as she hobbled back to the other woman. Spinning her walker so the chair faced Camelia, she put on the brake and sat down with a grunt. Certainly I've got the time. I've got nothing but time. What would you like to know? Camelia thought about it. What did she want to know? Why Vera had reacted so strangely at the news she'd bought Love Cottage? Why, since her arrival, had a shadow of foreboding permeated Camellia's mood like a San Francisco fog? She settled on something more neutral. Have you lived here long? Ed and I bought the place, oh, Vera gathered her thoughts, some 20 years ago when we got back from New Zealand. The only ones here longer are the Linders. She pointed to the stately home at the top of the hill. By boundary, we're both in the Cliffmont district, though you never get them to admit it. They tend to be a bit squirrely when it comes to their heritage. Camellia wasn't sure what Vera meant by squirrely, but the woman didn't elaborate, at least not about that. The general stores over the rise on the other side of town, Vera said, continuing her virtual tour. There's a path between your place and mine that runs straight to the Linder Square, so you don't have to drive all the way around. If you need gifts or books, we have a little mall just up the road. The big grocery is in the mall, and so is the print shop and the library. Do you read, Amelia? That's Camelia, Camelia corrected. Yes, and I love libraries. I'll need to get a card. Well, that shouldn't be a problem since you're going to live here. Again, the hint of a frown shaded Vera's face. How'd you ever decide on Ocean Cove, if you don't mind my asking? This isn't exactly your trendy retirement destination. It's not even a blip on most maps. Ed and I, we came across it totally by accident. We'd been looking for somewhere else entirely. I'd never noticed it either, Camelia agreed, and I've been all up and down this coast. It was a friend of mine, a real estate agent who discovered it. She knew I was looking for a beach place at a reasonable price. So when this one came along, she jumped on it. Camelia glanced at her new home, only a single story. And the rooms were small, but it was cozy, just right for an older lady and her cat. I couldn't believe my luck finding something so nice within my price range. It was such a lovely view of the cove, too. She gasped, cast her gaze along the shore and far out to the never-ending blue. Wow, said Camelia under her breath. 
not for the first or last time. Her eye rolled around to Vera, who was staring, mouth open, as if she'd just seen a ghost. Camellia started. What? What is it? Then you don't know? Camellia frowned uneasily. Was there something wrong with the place after all? Of course there was. She should have known that an ocean view house at the price she paid was too good to be true. Possibilities del deluged her mind. Was it a lean? An old meth lab? But those things would have shown up on the sale. Plans for a future freeway cutting through? Not flood prone at this elevation, though it might have been built on a fault line. Was the cliff about to crumble? What, she gasped, what don't I know? You should probably ask your realtor, Vera hemmed. I can't believe they didn't tell you straight out. No, you tell me, Camelia demanded, her concern overtaking her good manners. What's the matter with my house? Vera turned an even lighter pale and wrung her hands, a gesture rarely seen outside, seen outside of films. It's not the house, dear. Mr. Chamber, Chamber kept it up nice. The house is fine. It's what happened outside the house. Right there, in fact, she nodded to the front stoop, a newly painted, lovely color of blue that shone and sparkled in the summer sun. Camellia waited, but Vera had stalled. What, Vera, please, she insisted. I need to know. After a further pause, the woman gave in. Yeah, sure you do. She spoke slowly as if pulling the words from a faraway place. I'd want to know if it was me. A robin chirped in a nearby fig tree. A car crawled past, then backed out again when the driver realized the road was a dead end. Finally, Vera took a deep breath and turned her dark eyes on Camellia. He was killed, dear, she said in a near whisper. Jonathan Chamber was murdered. Okay, now I got to get rid of this. Got to get rid of this screen share. How do I do that? Try hitting escape. Escape. There we go. And then, yeah. Here we are. I'm sorry. No. I was I was telling you and I was muted. So, you no. know. Oh, oh. Apparently 18 months later and we still, right. still have trouble yeah. with this. But. I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Molly. That was great. I actually have one other little oh. very short uh, part that introduces uh, our ghost cat, if right. I have time for that. Yeah, definitely. We've got time. Okay. As Camellia contemplated her new kitchen cabinets, she heard the lightest of plops, someone hopping up onto the table. She looked around, expecting to see her cat blaze, but to her surprise, the surface was bare. Hurmph, she grunted as she began to put away her groceries. Then she heard the sound once more as the culprit jumped down, a distinct plunk followed by the click of claws as he made his way across the floor. Blaze, she began, turning to the sound. The, Though the room was awash with shadows, there were none dark enough to conceal her tuxy boy. The floor was empty of cat. Blaze, is that you? Her voice seemed to echo and she paused, noting the hint of a waver. Then a distinctive meow resounded from the living room and in pranced the cat in question. Oh, there you are, she said too loudly as she swept him into her arms. I was starting to think I was going batty. Burying her face in his fur, she breathed a sigh of relief. She massaged his backbone and scratched his sideburns, eliciting a rumbling purr that rose to audible proportions in the quiet of the coming night. Suddenly, the purr cut off mid-rumble, and the big cat tensed. Struggling out of Camellia's grasp, he gained the floor with one long leap. Ears back and mouth open, he circled like a wildcat. After two full rounds, he stopped, facing the murky corner. Next, he did something Camellia had never seen the gentle feline do before. He arched his long back and began to hiss like a Halloween cat. Camellia stared without comprehension. What is it, Blaze? What are you looking at? Understandably, he didn't answer, but the hissing ceased as abruptly as, as it had begun, and now he just eyed the place with deep suspicion. Camellia followed his gaze, peering into the gloom, but not detecting anything aside from the dark. The very dark darker than it should be. 
Suddenly a shape began to coalesce against the blackness. A wave of vertigo hit Camellia full force and she grabbed the edge of the table to keep herself from falling. This can't be, she whispered into the gloom. It was impossible. There was no way she could be seeing what was right before her eyes. A cat made of mist, white and vaporous as smoke, yet unquestionable, 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 I can't say that word, unquestionably present. Camellia could pick out every hair, every whisker. The almond, eye, almond eyes glowed red and she gasped in terror. Then the whole thing flip-flopped, the white switched to black and the red eyes to em emerald green. All ghostly continents vanished, resolving into a quite normal looking cat. Blaze sunk into a loaf position. His ears perked forward in interest rather than fear. Camellia watched in morbid fascination to see what would happen next. The black cat observed the pair with an enigmatic stare, then opened her mouth into a grand yawn, which climaxed in a soft and very real mew. She gave a slow blink, a love blink, and suddenly Camellia's terror vanished. Soji, she offered, for who else could it be but the ghost cat of Ocean Cove? Then, when Camellia thought she had recovered from the shock of seeing a specter in her kitchen, she got a second surprise. Yes, Soji answered in perfectly understandable English. It is I. That's it. Another cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> Keep us wanting to read more. I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for that, um, for those uh, two different readings. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to see if there's any questions in our chat. And if not, I've got a couple that hopefully will be interesting. Um, all right, let me check. I'm not seeing anything there. So, um, let's see. Um, I wanted to ask something about um, both of your genres. Um, now I know that that you write in different, in, both write in different stuff. So I'm curious to know um, when you choose to write in a certain genre, um, or does it come first? What comes first, right? The genre or the story, and um, uh, and and what do you, uh, how do you, how do how, what do you have to do to kind of break out of that and to try something different um, once you, once you find that you've kind of written in a certain way? Linda? Okay, I'm back. So uh, my, genre, my genre of the one I read to you today, I am referring to it as women's contemporary fiction and I suppose I would say I wanted to write in that in that genre so that sort of came first but also I had the ideas for that story and basically this story is a sequel to my other novel right before it so the character Cassie was more of a teenager and a minor character in the other one. And now she's venturing out on her own. But uh, of course, each one can be read without the other one. So that kind of carried me into another story. I don't know if that answers very well or not, but, <laughs> but I, I enjoy reading women's contemporary fiction on my own, just to kind of just, I love reading and that's one genre I enjoy reading in. So that's why I decided to explore that. Yeah, that's uh, similar to my uh, mm -hmm. experience in that uh, I read cozy cat mysteries and uh, cozy mysteries and cat mysteries sub sub genre. Uh, so it was just, uh, it just worked out that I would my stories would go in that direction. Mm -hmm. As for the sci fantasy, um, those I started quite a while ago. And uh, I do not read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, but I do read some of both and have read, you know, a lot of the classics. Um, mm -hmm. So when I start a story, it just kind of does its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
often I just start with a title and then it rolls along into, into a book. Uh, I had to tweak it a little bit when I started my Crazy Cat Lady Cozy Mystery series because um, I didn't realize I was going to write in the cozy genre. So when I figured that out, I had to go back and take out all the swear words. And... <laughs> yes, the, the rules for the various genres. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm curious to know what you, um, uh, what, what's your kind of um, go-to method for overcoming obstacles that you reach with your writing, which we all know we face at various times? Like what? Writer's block? Yeah, writer's block or um, maybe a lack of inspiration. I guess those could probably be on the same, those are the same thing, but, um, or, or maybe, um, you know, uh, frustrations with, with a character or a plot or setting that you're working on. Hmm. Well, I don't get writer's block um, because I had some very, very good advice back at the beginning of my writing career uh, from William Shatner, who said that, as someone asked him, he was writing books then, you know how he does all these different things. Uh, at that point, he was writing books and someone asked, what do you do to overcome writer's block? And he said that writer's block occurred when you'd gone somewhere wrong in the story. You need to go back to where the story worked and start from there. So that's fixed everything for me every time. Um, and I, I don't usually have a problem with it. Uh, as far as frustration, uh, yeah, I, we all have that. Uh, um, I, I get obsessed if I have a problem with something, I just get obsessed with it until I figure it out. And, Mm -hmm. right that's how that works yeah I suppose for me um I don't often get writer's block either I left a once I start an idea for a story I to kind of do as you said I let it kind of become its own thing <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go and I let it do what it's going to do. And usually if I keep at it, I find my, my way through it. Um, and I think having a scheduled time to write helps keep the overcoming of the writer's block for me. So yeah, I don't usually get it either, but I, I know it's very possible. <laughs> I think every writer faces that possibility yeah. absolutely um but that's that's good to know I mean I, I imagine it must be quite a benefit to being a writer if you if you're able to just kind of power through and, and keep yeah. that thanks thanks for that advice Molly for our uh, aspiring writers or current writers in the room um so we had a question in the chat how has um you know the last 18 months we've been stuck in this pandemic we're doing things very differently than we used to do um than before um so curious how how the past 18 months and the various phases of of that time um how has that affected your writing well um it hasn't changed my writing lifestyle much at all because as a absolute introvert who hides away in a little room every day, uh, being isolated and uh, on lockdown was no different. Um, what it changed was getting my books out there because I've published three now that have never seen a human interactive in-person event and that really takes away from kind of the that thrill of oh boy I'm finally done with the book and here it is and let me show you it um, but the writing no uh, the last period of our history the last some years have been so difficult though and that did wear on me. And I, I've seen several of the other presentations and uh, the keynote speaker uh, presentation last night, Laura. 
And these people were talking about, you know, writing important work and capturing this time of uh, unprecedented change and uh, warring factions. And sometimes I felt like I should be writing something other than uh, little cozy stories, but uh, I actually believe that the the cozy, uplifting, happy ending stories have a real place right now. And uh, apparently my readers do too. I got a very sweet fan letter from someone recently that said that the optimism in my book, this book actually, Ghost Cat, um, which I try and put in all my books. I don't, they're not just for fun. They're, they're supposed to mean something too. You know, she said that that was really uplifting for her. So that, that was very fulfilling for me. I guess I would have to agree with Molly about the lockdown thing. <laughs> it really doesn't have much bearing on a writer. But uh, I did kind of go through a little bit of um, probably like everyone. You just, uh, well, it's just different, you know, because you aren't seeing other people. And um, so it did affect my writing a little bit, but I finally got a hold of myself and, and plowed through. <laughs> but I think, yeah, the biggest challenge now is that we still aren't doing in-person things very much. And I'm, I'm kind of sifting through that in my mind now with this new book of how I'm going to approach that. But because um, before that was, I don't know, it was like a, a reward at the end of all this writing that you can get it out and meet people and and just share it. And now it's a little different. So I'm trying to find my way through that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all different now. It's for, I mean, I, I've seen that it's true for all artists and every walk of life, it's all different. <laughs> so we just have to figure it out as we go, I guess. Mm -hmm. This conference is one way. <laughs> yeah, it's really been good. This virtual approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one piece of advice that's often given to um, our uh, given to writers is to is to read more. Right? Is to you know that's one of the best ways that you can improve your writing is to read. Yeah. And um, so, I'm curious uh, what you're reading currently, and um, and uh, and anything that you might recommend that folks read. Oh boy. Well, I read lots of different things. Um, some I read because people ask me to, and some I read because I, it strikes my fancy. I have a whole load of cat mysteries on my Kindle that I haven't read yet. Um, I, I just finished The Lost Symbol by Dan Brown. <laughs> so that has nothing to do with, there's no cats in it. <laughs> but it, you know he's a uh famous uh author you know well followed yeah. and so i found it really interesting to listen to some of his style um his the way he writes yeah and it was a great story well yeah, I've done lots of reading during this lockdown. Let's yeah. See. <laughs> but uh, prior to the to this time, one of my favorite authors that got me into uh, writing contemporary women's fiction was uh, reading through all of Jojo Moyes. I just love her stories. And she did go with some sequels, too, which I kind of like that idea. Uh, Kristen Hanna books and now right now I've been reading um, what is it their beach house stories Mary Monroe or something like that it's in the other room <laughs> but uh, yeah I've been going through all of hers and but I too have read Dan Brown before but I don't know I just can't get enough of reading so it does help yeah. it just helps you encounter words and how you 
put them together and stuff. I just, yeah, I think it's yeah. very helpful as a writer. And I like listening to audio books because uh, having somebody speak it uh, shows shows uh, what kind of conversation works and, you know, mm -hmm. um, what doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think um, that book, maybe is it uh, The Beach House by Mary Alice Monroe? Is that the? Yes, there we yeah. go. Thank you. Not the last name. So, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I'm been going through all of hers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, They're thanks so much. Very fun. Yeah, especially yeah. summer, but now we're in fall. But <laughs> yeah. Well, if we want to try to remember the summer, uh, you know, as, as, yeah, we exactly. in, as we slip into the cold months and the dark months. No, so, yes. Yeah. Well, um, I don't see any other. We'll just I'll pause for a moment, see if there's any other questions. If not, um, you know, I just I want to thank both of you for taking the time to be here today with us to share your words and your wisdom. Um, we're always so happy um, with all of the um, authors who come and join us for Words and Pictures Festival. Um, this is officially the last session of the two-day virtual series. Um, so if you are joining us um, via recording um, later, uh, you will be able to see many more of our programs and our authors. Um, we're so excited um, to be able to offer this. And um, we'll hope to see you next year. Save the date. It's always the second Saturday of October. And um, we'll see if we if we keep it a, a, a two-day event. And we are looking at um, keeping it virtual, at least part of it. So keeping having some aspect of the of the of the program that would be virtual um, for accessibility. Um, but we'll, we'll hopefully be back in person, but we'll see. No promises. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, thank, thank you to you. Diane for thank being you, here um, on the staff thank of the, the library. library. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, Port Vancouver Regional Library has had such a wonderful time hosting this event for the past five years. So thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.